Um, so we're here with Robert Bryant. Today is Tuesday, May 8th, uh, 2018. Um, we're here at Robert's house. And what, what neighborhood is this? East Village. East Village, in the East Village. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, Stonewall and the years leading up to, to Stonewall. Um, so do you want to just start out um, with a little birth date, uh, a little bit about your, your family, uh, where okay. you grew up? Uh, I was born in Florida, Orlando, in 1945. But we moved to Virginia, to the Washington area, in 1950. So I was five years old. So basically, I grew up in Virginia. And uh, went to the, ultimately, well, first of all, went to this uh, high school, very upscale high school, uh, J.E.B. Stewart, Confederate name. They're trying to change it now. And uh, there was no mention anywhere that I can recall from my youth of gay, queer, homosexual. It was as though they didn't even exist. So um, I was aware of what I was interested in, but I tried to ignore it or pretend that I guess this is what everybody goes through. And that went on for a while, but then ultimately in my senior year in high school, I had this government teacher, Coach Falls, who was also the football coach. And he didn't like to talk about government, it bored him. So he would talk about current events and things that were happening and get the class's response. So he said that uh, this house a couple of miles away had been raided by the police because there was homosexual activity there. Mm -hmm. And what did everybody think about this? Mm -hmm. So the girls were saying, oh, I feel so sorry. They're so sick, these poor sick people. And the boys were saying, boy, I just like to get a hold of those guys. And this went on for an hour, and I'm sort of cowering in the corner, and I finally was thinking, oh my God, I think I'm one of these people that they're talking about. It was kind of traumatic. So at this point, I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. And so um, I went to the University of Virginia my first year at UVA. In the gym, I never looked. I looked down at the floor. I didn't look at all the naked guys. I didn't take the naked swim class because I was trying to avoid any of that and trying to pretend. And uh, I met these three guys uh, individually who were all friends. And they were joining a fraternity. And so I thought, well, I should join too to be with these friends. So we all joined this fraternity. And then the second year at the University of Virginia, we all lived together in an apartment. Well, by the end of the year, it became evident that all of us were gay. And none of us knew it when we became roommates in the first place. And that's how those things happened in those days. So, but I had, at this point, I had decided that I was not going to try to uh, fight it anymore. So my third year, I uh, seduced one of them, one of the four, and I wouldn't say we became boyfriends, but we played around. So how did it become evident that all of you were? Well, forgetting? one of them, one of them admitted it to me. Another one, I opened his door unexpectedly, and his little brother in the fraternity was on top of him. And then they pretended they were wrestling. <laughs> and then the other one would say, well, I think, I think uh, if I had a choice between an ugly girl and a cute boy, I'd take a cute boy. There were these little hints like that that sort of moving in that direction. But none of them, I mean, as far as I know, nobody had really done anything. Mm -hmm. But this one, this last one, was the one that I finally seduced. So that third year, we became aware of the gay scene at the University of Virginia. We would spot different people around, and they would speak to each other, and we figured out what the group was. Mm -hmm. And we got into the group, and there was this big party we went to, the first gay party I ever went to. Uh, people kissed, shocking. Hadn't done that before. That was a whole new idea. 
And uh, then came my first summer out in Washington, D.C. And well, I had a car. Before you get to that, can you yeah. tell me more about the campus scene? What, what did that look like at the time? What did it mean to be gay on campus? It meant being completely closeted and hidden and secret. And there were, the only way you would know, there were messages written on the men's room walls, particularly in the library and parts of the stacks that people didn't go to very often. And, um, and I suppose some people were having sex, but I didn't. Uh, one person who became a very good friend of mine, I was sitting in the Newcomb Hall student area, and uh, he was sitting in a chair near me, and he was sort of rubbing his leg up and down, and I figured something was going on, so I got up and went to the door, and then I spun around and sort of looked at him and nodded my head, and then he followed me to the bathroom. Well, I wasn't really interested. I just wanted to make contact with somebody. So we became friends, and so that's the way I met one person anyway. That's how secretly things happened. I mean, I went back about 20 years later to UVA, and they were having uh, gay student dances in Newcomb Hall where I was undercover, so things changed a lot. Yeah, so at the time you kind of just met somebody randomly, they interviewed to someone else. Yeah, so or as I address. say, I observed these people that I figured were gay, and then uh, they would speak to each other, and I would sort of put it all together, this, this network mm -hmm. of, uh, of secret gay people that I assume everybody else didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, and as I, as I uh, mentioned before, there was this one person who really stood out. His uh, name was John Goodman. He had a beetle haircut, he, had a, he wore a cape, he had bell bottoms and beetle boots. He was not a typical Ivy League UVA student. So I definitely watched his goings on around uh, campus, but of course nobody spoke to him because it was too scary and nobody wanted to speak to him. But my first summer out in uh, Washington, D.C., I was at the Georgetown Grill, which was maybe as big as this room, probably not. And everybody sat around in booths, and um, the way you met somebody was you would ask Kitty, the waitress, to send them a drink, and then she would point to who sent the drink, and that's how you met somebody, if was they were a, interested. Was this a gay bar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It's the legendary, I showed you a picture of it, it's in there, Georgetown okay. Grill. Um, on uh, uh, Wisconsin Avenue, right there, in the center of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw him in there once, and we had a big meeting, like, oh, I've seen you around at UVA, and blah, blah, blah. Well, he dropped out of UVA. He was moving to New York, and uh, before I get to my move to New York, so in Washington, the main thing to do was to go to the Georgetown Grill. There was another gay bar, but you also didn't dance there. You didn't dance in any bar in Washington. Um, you yeah, would just why, sit there. Why was that? It was not allowed. There was no dancing. I mean, you could, there was hardly room to move around. I mean, you just sit at your table and chair and look and listen to the music and talk. So I hardly went to this other gay bar because it was right across from the FBI and it felt a little uncomfortable waiting in line with the FBI observing you in those days because we were very afraid. I was working for the uh, summer in, in the government too. So that was another. Everybody was so afraid of their government jobs there, gay people. And if it was discovered that you Oh were yeah, gay, you're definitely out. You would have been fired. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So um, there was also a, uh, a cafeteria. It seems like there's always some late night eating place that gay people like to gather at, the Brits Cafeteria. And it was just, as they said, all the freaks would go there late at night and hang out. But the other main place was DuPont Circle. I have a magazine with a huge article in it because it was late at night, Every, the hippies, the homos, 
uh, misfits, weirdos, everybody would go and hang out at DuPont Circle. The bongo drums into the early morning hours, people with flowers in their hair talking about going to San Francisco. It was a very colorful scene. And I met, I met people there too. I mean, I mean, I would go, I was reading these letters I wrote to this friend who was in Jacksonville uh, about what was happening, mostly to make him feel bad that I was so popular and he wasn't and I was having a great time. And uh, I, I would go to the Georgetown Grill, then I would drive over to DuPont Circle, then I would drive back to the Georgetown Grill and you know, see what was happening in each of these places to keep up with all the action. So this went on for, um, I went back to UVA at the end of the summer feeling that I'm a star and everybody loves me and I'm beautiful. Be and Before you go on, can you, can you say a little bit more about what it felt like to be going to these spaces in the, what, mid, late 60s? 66. 66? Yeah, summer of 66. We shall live in legend. It was exhilarating. It was exciting. I mean, I was, I was, uh, 2020, actually. I guess I was illegal, come to think of it. Mm -hmm. I was uh, turned 21 in August, but I'd already been going there for uh, all those months, mm -hmm. being 20. And since nobody had ever paid me any mind before, suddenly, uh, I guess part of it was I got rid of my glasses and suddenly I became beautiful mm -hmm. and I became cool and uh, it was very exciting. I mean, I had to, I had gone from hardly knowing that there were homosexuals a couple of years before to being thrust right into the middle of this vibrant, exciting, colorful, if a, a bit small, gay world where practically everybody knew everybody else here. Mm -hmm. But you also said that it was, there was, it was terrifying too. I mean, to be like waiting in line. Oh, well, this is over at the FBI bar. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. At the Georgetown Grill, you didn't have to, you could go right in. It could be crowded. The, uh, the fun part at the grill was when straight people, couples, because it was right there in the middle of the strip where everybody was, would open the door and then you'd see the expression on their face as they looked around and everybody would scream and hoot and holler and they would <laughs> run screaming out the door. I don't know how much you want to hear about this, but uh, one time these two girls came in and said, well, anybody buy us a drink? I think they were about 17 or 18. And I don't know what movie, but I said, I will. So they came over to my table. I became very good friends with her. She became my cover with my parents mm -hmm. that I would go on dates with Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And uh, as she later told me, her idea, oh, she was going to convert me. But as it turned out, she became a lesbian. For nine months anyway, she had a lover. And then she called me about 1976 out of nowhere and said that she was married with children. So I guess, I think women have phases like that mm -hmm. more than men do. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, that's the kind of crazy thing that could happen. So, uh, so after that summer, Campus, Back to UVA feeling and feeling good and uh, feeling better than this boy who had always made me feel like I was the lesser. And uh, we had relations once that first night and then we never did again. And we sort of were on, even though we were rooming together at the fraternity house that year, we were kind of cool with each other for whatever reason. But he was going off to Richmond and, and meeting people, and I was uh, staying in contact with things happening at Washington. As I say, I went to visit John Goodman in, in New York to experience what the city was like. And it was true. It, was, uh, it seemed like the only place to be for a homosexual because like, I, uh, he took me to the Stonewall. And of course, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, people dancing and people kissing and people being crazy and carrying on and camping it up. And uh, the crowd, so I did move in, after law school uh, 
it went on for a while. I moved out. You may have to do some editing here and put things in proper order. So after UVA, even though I didn't particularly want to, I went uh, to law school. And law school, even though it seemed like the thing for a history major to do, not that I was enthusiastic about it, but um, law school was not going to get you out of the draft. And this is at the time of Vietnam. And there was no way I was going to Vietnam. I knew I would be killed. I would not survive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had heard this uh, homosexual, famous uh, writer, speaker, doctor, educator, uh, Dr. Frank Kameny on the radio. And I took it upon myself to find his phone number. I called him. I talked to him for about an hour. He gave me the names of three psychiatrists to call. So I called a psychiatrist, it cost me $50, well worth it. $50 was more like 300 at that time. Didn't tell my parents, needless to say. Incidentally, I never told my parents. They were happier. I mean, God knows, ultimately they knew. So, um, I got a letter from him, a very complimentary letter too, very complimentary to me, very flattering, but saying that I could not survive in a military setting. So I was bussed down to Richmond along with everybody else, called up for their physical and presented them with my letter. And I was called in to see the uh, commanding officer and he looked at it and he said, Northern Virginia, if figures, like that's where all the gay people are. And so then I had to speak to a psychiatrist there, an army psychiatrist, because people were using this as an excuse to get out. So they tried to ask you these really embarrassing, particular sexual questions to see how you will respond to them. And I responded with gusto and enthusiasm to all of his sexual questions. And he was very nice. He actually said that we would really like to have you anyway. We need people like you <laughs> in the Army. And I said, I don't think so. The but said yeah. yeah. And I said, but you know, if this were another situation, I would think that you were queer. And he said, oh, well, I guess you mean that as a compliment. And I said, of course I do. And that was the end of it. And I eventually got, they do not specify why you get out. Really? They just say you're 4F. Thank God. So were there risks involved in declaring yourself homosexual? Well, homosexual? you wouldn't get a government job, God forbid. Right. But, uh, I mean, who would really, even though my parents both worked for the government mm -hmm. in the Pentagon, but uh, I didn't want um, a government job. <laughs> I had already decided that I hated law school and was going to move to, to New York. So, um, the only thing, the aftermath of that was... A few weeks later, after I got the letter, my father came into uh, my room and said he wanted to have a talk with me. And he wanted to know how I really got out of the draft. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know. I had several things. I had my eyesight, and I had flat feet, and they don't tell you, you know. And then he said, did they have anything on there about being homosexual? I think he suspected. And I said, well, let me see. Yeah, I think that, yeah, there was something where you check a box, yes or no. And he said, well, what did you put? And I said, uh, why, well, no, of course. Mm -hmm. And he felt so much better. Mm -hmm. He was so relieved. It made him happy. And so, and so why did you say no at that point in time? What, 1967? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why was well, that's that? enough answer right there. It's 1967. Yeah, explain that. My parents were born in 1908. 
I mean, even years after this, my father was expressing disgust with homosexuals that he would see on TV and that sort of thing. So, and as I say that, I mean, if anybody heard of homosexuals, it was in the most negative way. I mean, they were sick, they were horrible, they were the worst part of society. And so I wasn't going to tell him that I was one of those people. And he was happy not thinking I was. And it didn't do any harm. I mean, he was happy, I was happy. I went off and lived my separate life in New York City where I could do what I pleased. I will say that many years later, when the AIDS thing broke out, my, I would speak to my parents on the phone every Sunday, and uh, they seemed concerned about, well, I hope you're being safe. They didn't say anything, they didn't specify, they didn't say safe in what way, but I hope you're being careful, I hope you're being safe. So, so maybe it was a kind of open secret. Yeah, I think at that point it was, and this second cousin of mine turned out gay. I figured he was from the beginning. I was watching him grow into a fine homosexual. And he told me that, oh yeah, all the relatives, they were all down in Orlando. Everybody was still down in Orlando, the relatives except my parents and I. And then he said, yeah, everybody knew you were gay down there. They all talked about it, mm -hmm. all the aunts and uncles and cousins. So, and, and the summer I went down there with my hair, summer blonde, didn't help the situation any. <laughs> because regular guys did, in Orlando in 1967 did not bleach their hair summer blonde. But it was all the rage. What can I say? The Beach Boys did it. Other people were doing it. It wasn't that strictly homosexual. It was just a thing, you know, like long hair at that time. So let's get to New York. Okay. What, what, what was so, it like in New York? So John said I had to come. So I did. And I found this apartment with a, somebody else who'd moved here for $69 a month on Thompson Street. And uh, John Goodman fell into uh, educating me about uh, gay life in New York. Meanwhile, ironically, my first job was at Bankers Trust Company, where I had to, I had my long hair, I had to comb it back tightly and try and look like a banker. Ultimately, after a year, that didn't work out. I left the bank. But in the meantime, so uh, he would take me to the, I'd never been to the theater. I'd never been to foreign films. I'd never been to ballet. He introduced me to all these things, which I suppose more than anybody, he changed my life and had an effect because in the first place, he got me to move to New York and introduced me to the Stonewall and the gay life and the trucks at the end of Christopher Street, which were a source of uh, unending joy at the end of the evening. So can we, we, can we talk about like a typical night out at the Stone Mall, how, how it would begin, how, would we, how the night would end? Well, I would, uh, John lived at 165 Christopher, which was just a block from the trucks, truth be known. And so I would usually go over to his apartment and uh, camp it up, and then we would walk up Christopher Street and possibly uh, stop in for a, a, a drink at uh, Julius's. Julius's. And there were all these straight acting guys there for the most part. I mean, this was, they was a little bit older, certainly much more conservative, more of the people who were concerned with appearing to be straight and fitting into society. The, the other bar was Danny's that was sort of somewhere in between. Um, older, generally, than the Stonewall, and, uh, but not nearly as conservative. There were hippies and that sort of gay hippies and all in in Danny's, but that was right on Christopher True, which you passed. But we were always wanted to go straight up to the Stonewall area because that's where where all the fun was. And by fun, you mean like younger people, hippies? There were younger people for sure. In a way, the Stonewall was kind of like a, 
a small town bar in that it did get a variety of people. Um, but certainly, predominantly white, mixed ages, mostly young. I mean, as young as 15, I know from personal experience, and of course, 18 was the, the legal age, so people got in regardless with fake IDs or whatever. So there were some drag queens, not a great deal. There were next to no African-American people. This did not happen really until the 70s that they came down and kind of took over Christopher Street and the, the Piers area. And the same thing with, uh, with lesbians, just a handful. I mean, I, I, was, I remember uh, an account in uh, David Carter's book about the Stonewall where this lesbian went in with a friend of hers and she was disappointed because there was just one lesbian that she could find and she was older. Mm -hmm. So this was not, it was not a, uh, a drag bar like Club 82, which was at 82 East 4th Street over here. It was not like Esquilita, which was on later on 8th Avenue. These were drag bars, but there was really just a colorful sampling at the stone wall. And I, guess I they mean, were queens, not drag that's queens. That's the thing. These many of these young guys were what would were real queens. Now, the other point that has to be made about queens is that it was often used as just a term amongst homosexuals for where are you queens going tonight and that sort of thing. It didn't even necessarily imply that you were limp-breasted and, uh, and wildly effeminate. You were just another homosexual. Uh, so I think that has led to a lot of uh, misconceptions. And then there were the more overt flame queens, which were a large part of the street youth and a number of the people who went to the Stonewall too, that were not only uh, effeminate, but uh, perhaps they would they would work mostly with men's clothes. Like you could take a shirt and tie it, sort of Havana style, and you had your hip huckered bell bottoms, and. Basically, I mean, what hippies were wearing was not that different from what, what these flame queens were wearing. I mean, down to the jewelry. The only thing was that the, the flame queens might have a little makeup on, too. They, I mean, they both had, could have long hair, acceptably, which, which was not a problem with hippies or, uh, or certainly with flame queens. So there was a, a street you've seen kind of around the bar as well. There was, but you know, I was not really, I didn't hang out in the, in the, the park across from, I just went in to the stone wall. Yeah. So I wasn't really aware of this whole scene that was happening there. Yeah. I mean, basically, I, I would, uh, was just in that immediate area. Although I will say, that further up Christopher Street, in the next block before you get to Greenwich Avenue, there, there's one stoop after another. And this was a major cruising area. People were sitting on the stoops. And people were parading by and camping it up and making cracks and occasionally picking up. And some of this extended around Greenwich Avenue to Mama's Chicken Rib, which was a block down Greenwich Avenue, mm -hmm. and but that was usually popular late, late in the evening, yeah. that people would go there after the bars. Yeah. I mean, basically, uh, after the bars, you could go to the trucks. Did I cover the Stonewall? No, we should talk a little bit more about the Stonewall, and I think also. I mean, I haven't gotten to the main events, but right. I mean, no, but just you know, it's also interesting it's that dark. you were kind of living a, a kind of double life at the time. During oh, the for day. sure, Bankers Trust Company. Right. Absolutely. All In fact, up, right? I continue to lead a double life to some extent, even today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, in the fashion world, God knows the fashion world is gay. But uh, I would be go to a, a, an event 
and uh, be in formal attire in my 1940 tuxedo with detachable wing collar and come home like a fireman and rip it off and put on jeans and a t-shirt and run out to to a bar. So that's pretty much, I, I thought of Oscar Wilde and, and the life that he led where he would be with the highest upper crust of society and then with the lowest, with all the, the rent boys. And I felt, and I, I was happy about identifying and leading that sort of, that sort of life. What, what do you mean happy about living that kind of life? I love Oscar Wilde and I was pleased to identify with him and his his lifestyle, mm -hmm. and fortunately not end up <laughs> the, the sad way that he did. The other person that I love was Noel Coward, the writer of Private Lives and, and known as the master because he did everything. Actually, I met, this is a little anecdote you can include or not, but I loved Noel Coward, as did my friend John Goodman, and he was appearing with Alfred and Lynn Fontaine on the Dick Cavett show. And of course, we had to be there. And after the show, we waited at the stage door for him. And when I went up and I said, oh, I love you, I love you. And he went very shyly. And I took his hand and kissed his hand. <laughs> and he said, oh, dear boy. And then he got into his limousine with uh, his 50-something uh, boy lover. And as the limousine pulled away, I went, and he went, and I was just jumping, jumping up and down with ecstasy. But at any rate, a little aside from 1971. Mm -hmm. So in the years after Stonewall. Yeah. So the Stonewall was, as they say, was dark and dank. It was not fancy. It was not nice. The drinks were watered down. You were afraid the glasses were dirty. They probably were. There were two rooms. Uh, one room had this long bar in it. The other room was for dancing with the, the jukebox. At the back of that was the uh, men's room. And uh, it seems like there was a fireplace and a mantle. It was never going, but off to, to one side where people would put drinks and stand and pose. But so we go in there and we would dance and we would watch other people dance and, and I did meet, I met a boyfriend, my first New York boyfriend who I was with for six months there. Mm -hmm. Dare I say he was 16 and not get arrested. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's one of the things that made the Stonewalls different. It that was. You could dance there, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It was. Okay. It was, uh, I assume people met at Julius's, but uh, I never met anybody there. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing about Julius's was they had a wall left over from the 1930s filled with autographed pictures of movie and theater stars from the 30s, which of course, a lifetime obsession. So that was what I liked best <laughs> in Julius's. So that, I mean, apparently it was a theater, a theater bar from way back, which means virtually a gay bar. Mm -hmm. Too. Uh, I mean, the oldest, so they say. So. Uh, and were you ever aware of the police or mafia presence at Stonewall? Or? I wasn't. No. I ignored it. I mean, I. It was never that I can recall raided while I was there. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I guess the guys look like they could be mafia, but I didn't think about it. I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't interested in that. Um, I just wanted to go and have a good time, which I did. So afterwards, uh, after the Stonewall, after the dancing and the cruising and the camping, uh, you could uh, go to Mama's Chicken Rib or you could go down to the trucks, as they were called which people just hearing that term might wonder, what in the world is trucks? Well, underneath the West Side Highway, there were trucks parked where they were kept until they were used again. It was like the, the parking storage area. So many of the trucks were left open as an open invitation to enter. And people did enter 
And uh, this could go on till dawn. I mean, I know it was going on years before I came to New York, because I'd heard about it from some people at UVA who said they went to New York. And um, there were times the police did raid the trucks. And the most notable time, there, there was somewhere between uh, one and two dozen police cars swept down, surrounded the trucks, were grabbing people right and left, dragging them out of the trucks. I took it on the lamb. I had long legs. I was taller. I was 6'2 then. Long legs. I went running up Christopher Street in with a policeman behind me. My friend John Goodman happened to be standing at 165 Christopher talking to friends. I said, John! And I just went running on up Christopher Street. I got away, as I later did at Stonewall. So it was an adventure down there. It was definitely an adventure. But uh, so if you didn't meet anybody, which was usually the case at the, the Stonewall, then uh, you could go down to the trucks or if you were a, a decent human being, you could go to Mama's Chicken Rib and have coffee and something yeah. to eat. So, I mean, at the time, because you were living this double life, were you concerned about possibly getting arrested and losing your job? You know, that's that the crazy thing. I mean, what's even crazier is the things that happened at Stonewall later that I wasn't thinking about that. Because that was really, I mean, I could have been in jail for the things that I did there. So could other people, but at any rate, I had more to lose. <laughs> and so why, why do you think you, you didn't think about that at the time? I was just going with the flow and enjoying myself and not, I was living my life and not worrying about the consequences. And you might say, it was the times. It was, uh, do your own thing, let it all hang out, be yourself, screw the man, fuck society, we're free to be whoever we want to be and do whatever we want to do. So it fit right in with how things were supposed to be, I mean, uh, according to the counterculture. And I did, I did relate to some extent to all that, the counterculture stuff, as other people did. And... Uh, to some extent, there was this hostility to the police, which was part of the counterculture. Um, this whole thing with the Democratic Convention in Chicago, where there was the police riot, I mean, it sort of united all groups against the police. I mean, politically serious, uh, uh, liberals, hippies, Yippies, uh, African Americans, uh, Black Power movement, and uh, now we were joining the homosexual mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. Were opposed to the police because they were hostile. They were out to get us. They were not being nice. Because they were a symbol of the establishment, the, the man. Yeah, the the the, the, the uh, most out there, often violent symbol of the establishment. Well, let's, so let's get to the nights of the riots. What, what was happening leading up to them? What, how, where were you paying the same scene of, of... Okay, well, it was a hot Friday night <laughs> to begin with. It was June, what, June 28th, something like that. So. Yes, Judy Garland had died, but I don't think that I or anybody else, I mean, I thought about it, but it certainly didn't fill me, fill me with rage and fury. So uh, that had happened. So I had gone to John Goodman's apartment, and we'd hung out for a while, and then we were walking up Christopher Street. And we weren't too far from Sheridan Square when somebody came running down the street. Uh, come to think of it, it was sort of like a, a gay Paul Revere shouting, uh, the police are here, the stonewall's being raided, 
come to Sheridan Square, it's happening, come to Sheridan Square, come to the Stonewall. And I guess that was like the start of a revolution, but yeah, like the British, the British are coming. So we did. And the funny thing is that I don't remember what happened to John Goodman after that in the midst of all this. It was like all of a sudden everything is happening all around and, and uh, I mean, I read in David Carter's book that John Goodman had called Jerry Hoos, who figures prominently in these documentaries and reminiscences of uh, the Stonewall, and told him to come. So apparently everybody was calling everybody and saying, come down to the Stonewall because there's something happening. Well, when we got there, there was a crowd, a big crowd. And the, the atmosphere was really sort of uh, festive and party-like. And people were being brought out of the stone wall. There was a paddy wagon. There was, uh, people were camping it up and screaming out funny things and making cracks. And then the, uh, when the drag queens came out, there were some drag queens, they were really camping it up and they really got the crowd going. One of them did put up some resistance, which kind of annoyed the crowd. I think it was around this point that, that people started, where they got this idea, I don't know. I don't even know if I did too, but they started throwing coins at the, the police, the paddy wagon, the whole scene. But it was still festive and fun. You know, people would come out and they, like, I'm here, and people would cheer, and they would camp over to the, uh, to the paddy wagon. Did it seem unusual to you that people were gathering around? It had never trying? happened before, yeah. but then I'd never been in a raid before, but I had never seen a crowd of homosexuals like this gathered in any one place. I mean, I'd gone to uh, Reese Park, Gay Beach, where there were a lot of homosexuals out on the beach. Been in the Stonewall, where a lot, but out on the street, a big crowd of homosexuals. That was something that I uh, I had not seen. So uh, it continued kind of lighthearted for a while, but then this this uh, lesbian who at the time was referred to as a bull dyke. I mean, she was a butch, big butch lesbian. And that's what they were called at the time. Even, needless to say, homosexuals used politically incorrect terms even with themselves and oh Mary and Miss Thing and girl and uh, queens, which as I say, practically a generic term for homosexuals. Like everybody's a queen. Uh, Queenie, that implies something else. That's getting more into the, the scream queen, if you are queenie. If you're just a queen, that's perhaps just a regular homosexual. So uh, I was just thinking that perhaps the only representative, they're very, few, I mean, they don't even exist today, practically, scream queens. There are hardly any effeminate homosexuals left. I mean, there is gay talk. I mean, the, you can hear oftentimes, like there was a documentary, Do I Sound Gay? And it was all about this gay way of speaking, which I think sounds sort of like valley girl talk, actually. But I think that <coughs> in those days, there was not this whole thing about, for most homosexuals, particularly homosexuals just coming out, what they were learning was how to be queenie from their friends. That was the way they were taught to act. That's the way homosexuals act. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Now people are more or less taught to be, or they, maybe they're not even taught, they just act like regular people. Somehow. It's almost like a rite of passage. Yeah. For young it was, men to have like a flamboyant Yes, to be phase. flamboyant, yeah. exactly. And whether they, um, I assume that most of them probably went out of it. But then, I mean, I was going to say today, I mean, Johnny Weir 
the, the skater. God knows he is a flaming queen. And as effeminate as he is in his dress, he is not a drag queen. He is not a transvestite. He is just a wildly effeminate man, which is what most of these people were. They were not drag queens. They were effeminate young men. They didn't have the money Johnny Weir does to put on the outfits he does, but they were still in their own version of some sort of a feminine attire. Mm -hmm. So at any rate. Gender bending and, I mean, you mentioned the hippies before. They yeah, gen they're gender bending. bending. Gender, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this Butch Dyke comes out. She night. comes out, and she is, uh, she's putting up a fight because they were being rough with her. I think they handcuffed her, come to think of it. But they, uh, they were pushing her, they were shoving her, she was screaming, she was kicking back. And uh, she was really getting at the, the gay crowd, like, what is the matter with you guys? Why aren't you doing something? Why are you letting this happen? Why are you just standing there? And this started to get, people began to feel guilty about being, and they, at least they started calling out things to the police, you know, let her go, don't be so rough, and throwing more coins, whatever good that did. Do you remember how you felt at the time? I felt like, uh, I felt challenged. I mean, God knows I didn't feel like I had to live up to being a man at that time, but I did feel like we should, we should do something, because we wildly outnumbered the police. And as with the entire evening, I never even considered that the police had guns and that this was not just play acting, that this could be really serious. So I thought, well, we should do something. So. I don't think we really did at that point, except we got angrier and we screamed things and we threw coins. But then they eventually, I think, dragged her, dragged her away in the car. And then at this point, I think, I think there were no more vans or cars or anything. And the crowd was getting more hostile and the crowd started throwing things. And I did too. I can remember, which seems crazy, and this is just all part of being caught up in the moment, trying to pull up these paving stones from around these trees and, and hurling them at the police, which is pretty crazy. And the police were coming out and clubbing. They were basically situated in the door, but they would sort of charge out, and then they grabbed people. And, pull them back to the door. Well, they had grabbed somebody, I don't know who, and they were kicking and hitting them. And uh, one of the policemen was right in front of the door with his rear end sticking right out. And I, I don't know what I was doing in the front of the crowd anyway, but there I was. I charged and with all my force kicked him in the rear and knocked him flat. I hate to, well, I guess he probably fell on the poor guy, but at any rate, another policeman tried to grab me and I took off and he took off after me through the crowd, through the village, over, I ran and ran and ran all the way to Thompson Street. Why I was heading home, I don't know, but I was heading back to where I lived and eventually I lost him. So what else could I do? But I turned around and went back. So what, what was going through your mind at the time? Because here you are, you work at a bank during the day. And I'm a year of law school. And you're law school, you're not exactly like the profile of a revolutionary. I know, and I think that's one of the points to be made about this whole thing, is that it was not just drag queens and street youth who were involved in in all this. There were all kinds of people. Like there were a variety of people who went to the stone wall. There were young and old and I mean it was the only place to go for dancing in the city, like in some small town. So that's where people went. 
And it was crazy. As I say, I didn't even think about how what this might mean if they had caught me, aside from being beaten, that I would have been thrown in jail and I could have gone to jail for years for assaulting a policeman, which is what I did. But somehow it seemed like, I don't know, like a game of some kind at the, at the time. This is something where it's like, it's not that serious. We're having fun, we're, we're protesting, we're angry and we're releasing our anger and nothing's really gonna happen as a result of all this, but I mean, ultimately it did happen as a result of all this, I guess. Why do you think you felt that way at the time though? I don't think, being... I mean, obviously I didn't have time to really think about. I was just responding to the moment. The whole thing was, as others have said, it happened spontaneously. And I don't think anybody was thinking rationally. It, it was an, a building emotion that started with the the people being taken out of the bar and the drag queens, they were sort of an opening act to get the crowd going, to get the crowd interested before the main event came along, as it turned out, even though that wasn't, clearly wasn't what was planned. So I came back and by this time, the police were, had retreated into the stone wall completely and people were throwing everything they could get their hands on. Uh, bottles, beer cans, bricks, cobblestones, everything. And, and they were holed up inside. And then people started to, uh, some guy squirted, squirted lighter fluid over the, the wooden, window, blocking the window of the stone wall, and lit that on fire. Well, it didn't last very long, but then the people piled up trash in front of the, uh, the stone wall window and lit that on fire. And then somebody took a trash uh, container that was mesh with trash and lit that on fire and threw it through the window, the, uh, the wooden window. Um, I don't think it really went in, but it was crazy. I mean, we were trying to burn the place down with the police in it. It was, it was in, well, you know, they say that mobs have a, uh, a mind of their own and that people do things in groups that they would never do alone. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was egging everybody else on. Everybody was trying to top what everybody else was doing. So ultimately, the, the, the fire department came with the sirens. They couldn't get on the street, but they came with the sirens and all. And then the, uh, the backup police came and the, the, the TPF, the, uh, the armored police. But I don't really remember more of what happened at that point. I don't know if it's because I went home then, which would seem kind of crazy, or, uh, or maybe I went down to the trucks because all the police were in Sheridan Square and I wouldn't have to worry about being raided. <laughs> but, um, so that was pretty much the first night from what I can remember. So the second night, the, the word had really spread around to what had happened. And so people came to the village, just all kinds of people came to the village, not just gay, but I mean predominantly gay. And uh, I don't know, I've read that there were thousands. I mean, maybe there were, but it was, it was a crazy scene. It dominated the whole West Village. There were, I mean, stores were closed because of all this stuff going on. Uh, once again, the beginning of the evening was not that serious. It was more of a carnival atmosphere. But ultimately, uh, it got more serious. Uh, people were, at first they were uh, surrounding cars on Christopher Street. 
talking about, you know, recapturing Christopher Street for only gay people, that heterosexuals were not allowed to drive on Christopher Street. <laughs> so I don't think that succeeded, but uh, it continued. But that then one of the main, the TPF, the, the Tactical Patrol Force, came once again with their helmets and their plastic face masks and their armored bodies and the clubs and they started trying to clear the streets. Well apparently this, some of this had happened the first night but I don't remember it happening the first night. So the second night I was observing, I was watching Christopher Street and this, this Rockettes kick line had formed on one end of Christopher Street and they were doing perfect inline Rockettes kick and these were the, huh? Who were they? These were the real queeny, uh, campy, young homosexuals. These were, these were not uh, tough guys by any means. I mean, the only people who were really fighting like this were the, the, the campy ones. I don't think that, that I or uh, anybody from Julius's would have gotten into a, kick, a Rockettes kick line. Were they, do you think they were street kids? I think they probably were. Yeah. And because they were probably thinking they had nothing to lose except being beat up maybe. So on one end was the, them kicking and we're the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls, we don't wear underwear. And at the other end were these lines of the tactical police force with their helmets and their face shields and their, their body shields and their clubs and they're slowly marching at a very, it was sort of like a, a Roman style march where you form this unbreakable line with shields and, and move ahead, impenetrable, but very slowly uh, down the street. And the girls kept kicking and singing and they kept getting closer and closer. And I just, I was in, I was in awe that I was almost moved to tears by this, the, I guess the bravery of them standing there in the face of, of these armored tactical patrol force. Well, they got, it was like, it must have been seven or eight feet from them before the line finally broke and ran. But it reminded me, I was thinking later, it was like the Battle of Bunker Hill where they say don't don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Well, this was don't run until they are right on top of you. Waited to the very last minute before they took off. And I, apparently some of them were caught and some of them were hit because I think once they started running that the, the patrol force started running after them. Uh, that was the big event for me on the second night. A little side note is that, as, uh, as has been reported before, uh, the Medellin Society and uh, Julius's and people like that were not supporting the riots and all the activities that were going on. Well, oh, I should also describe this, the scene that developed in the village it was really like a war zone. At this point, like two o'clock in the morning, there was smoke everywhere from all the trash cans were lit on fire. There were sirens and police cars and ambulances and no, at this point, the regular people were gone. It was just the rioters and the police and the smoke and it was, it was like something out of a movie going on in the village. 
And I thought, boy, this is going to be big news. This is going to be splashed all over the headlines of the Times. There was hardly a thing about it. I couldn't believe that something this big could happen and have so little reporting mm -hmm. for it. But back to uh, the, the Medellin and the Julius's. So, as I say, they were not participating and they were not approving. Well, that second night, I saw typical regular guy Julius's people grabbing queens who had set fires in the crash cans and turning them over to the police. Mm -hmm. Now that's really, I mean, it's one thing not to participate, but to work with the police. I mean, they were showing what, aren't, see, we're, uh, some homosexuals are really good citizens and we help out, aren't we wonderful? So what do we get for this? Nothing. Um, ask me a question. That's um, it. Well, I, can you talk a little bit more about the kick line? And I'm wondering, at the time, what was the significance of camp? What, like, what did it that was camp? life. Everything was camp. I mean, you camped about everything. That was the homosexual lifestyle for, for real red-blooded homosexuals. You didn't take anything seriously. You camped about everything. Everything was a joke. You turned everything into something funny. You camped it up. What, why? What, was that a because this was part of our, our culture, our distinctive society, apart from a way of separating ourselves from the heterosexual world and a way of sort of uh, fighting back or rebelling against the heterosexual world by taking, by completely rejecting what they say is proper behavior and doing something on our own. And this is something that goes back hundreds of years. I mean, this wasn't something that was developed in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. This camp behavior is forever. Yeah, I guess it goes back to no, no cowards. Yeah, Oscar Wilde. Yes. And I just got this book on uh, the history of uh, gays in London. It goes back to the Romans. I haven't read it yet, but so it was going on for a long time. And the, you know that you have your own language, your own slang, your own way of, uh, of dressing, your own overall culture, your own music, the things that you like. Uh, it's a shared culture and campiness was part of it. I mean, there was the, like the, the theater of the ridiculous and Charles Ludlum and Jackie Curtis and Andy Warhol and the superstars and everything was camp. It was all camp. Hmm. Did you think about the riots at the time as a kind of theater or is that just in retrospect? It's in retrospect. Okay. Of course it was, but I, as I say, we, at least I, and I don't think other people were really thinking about what was happening. We were responding to the emotions and the feeling of the moment. And I think part of it was the pent up emotions of resentment to the police and being tired of being treated and abused this way and fighting back in some way. But it was not conscious. It just, it, boiled up from an it. It was an emotion more than a rational decision. You mentioned media coverage and I guess the village voice. Yeah, that's, coverage. yeah, this, I'm sorry, I bought this that Wednesday after the riot mm -hmm. and it has weathered a bit in the ensuing 49 years. Mm -hmm. But the coverage in the liberal village voice, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, dykes and flame and queens and uh, the the uh, the queen bees are buzzing and and all of this kind of uh, negative emphasizing the Nelly effeminate well of course they were right about that <laughs> but this was it was not a politically correct coverage even in the right. in the village voice of what was happening it wasn't totally unsympathetic I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Can and you one say of a little bit about the um, the people in the, the photo there. What you remember of, of them? Well, they were regulars at the Stonewall, 
and, and seen around. I mean, one of them up here in the, uh, the window, I did end up going home with at some point to a, uh, it's a Mercer Hotel that was used for, I don't think the word is homeless shelter, it was where extremely poor people are put up in apartments, mm -hmm. whatever that's called. And I remember that his, he said to be quiet, and I said, why? And he said, because my mother's sleeping in the next room. So, that's one of them. <laughs> I did not get to know the others, so I saw them around regularly. I mean, this, this one that you can't see is probably the most screaming queen because she looks virtually like a woman, but she's not in drag. She just looks very effeminate. And then some of them look like, a, one of these guys looks like a regular college boy with his wireframe glasses. Of course, wireframe glasses went along with a whole hippie look at that time. But um, they basically, for the most part, have uh, preppy college hair like I would have seen at University of Virginia. I mean, they do not have beetle haircuts or hippie haircuts for the most part, maybe a couple of them in the background, but they were young. They are reputedly street. They reputedly hang out in the, the park across from the stone wall, though as I say, I didn't notice them there. I would see them around and in the stone wall, maybe walking up and down Christopher, cruising that block between uh, the stone wall and Greenwich Avenue. Mm -hmm where there was a lot of camping and cruising yeah. going on. So at the time, I mean, after that, that second day of, of riots, what was the significance for you? Or, or did the significance only come later in life? The real significance definitely only came later. Okay. I mean, obviously the, we f felt like this is something that doesn't happen every day. This is somehow a special event. but. I, don't, I certainly did not think this is the beginning of gay power and gay liberation and gay revolt. I didn't think about that. Apparently some people did, but maybe they were obviously more politically minded than I was mm -hmm. because I did not go out and, and join the GLF or the GAA or, or any of that. I was just thinking about enjoying life getting out of the bank and getting into fashion instead, <laughs> where I could be a little freer. And uh, I mean, the next thing that I did was political, and even that was kind of half-hearted, was go to the final, to the end of the first Gay Liberation Day parade in Central Park. Mm -hmm. So I didn't march. I went to the end in the park, which was the fun, campy part so I didn't have to suffer the slings and arrows of the crowd marching up the street. Just had the fun part at the end. And I guess, you know, as you look back now, how did you start to, to think about the, the kind of larger political significance of, of Stonewall? Or how do you see it differently from your, your vantage point today? Compared to then? To compared to then, yeah. Well, completely, completely different because then it was just a spontaneous, crazy, wild event, a riot that we uh, executed with, to me, without any thought of its ultimate meaning or what would happen as a result of this. But now it was obviously the beginning of the whole gay rights movement that has now come to gay marriage, which is something that, as everybody has said, is crazy, completely inconceivable. And I might add that in those days, we thought this is one of the good things about being gay, is that we don't have to think about gay marriage or getting married. Of course, we were thinking about getting married to women or any, but just the idea of having to have a responsible mate and raise children was the last thing we wanted to do. We just wanted to 
enjoy ourselves, get on with our career, think about ourselves and our friends, not have to worry about, and have a lover now and then for a while. I mean, I was with Garrett for two and a half years. And ultimately, I mean, after saying all that negative thing about relationships, uh, in 73, I met this young man at a, uh, this wild party. At the, well, this gives you an idea of how things change so quickly. There was this rich guy, George Paul Roselle, who staged parties, huge, glamorous parties, costume parties, in 1973, just a few years later. Uh, he did one at the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, this one was in the Rainbow Room at Radio City Music Hall. Mm -hmm. Ultimately glamorous. And that's where I met this boyfriend at 6 o'clock in the morning with the sun streaming in. And uh, we were together for 11 years after that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't live together. We didn't consider adopting children. <laughs> we didn't have any anything more serious than enjoying each other's company in mind. But you mentioned the, the party as, a, as an indication that things have changed because there wouldn't have been such a public party Right. Before. I mean, really, not only was this public, but it was in the most glamorous locations in New York. And people were all dressed up in these glamorous... The, the theme of this one was Fellini Satyricon. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was, I didn't fit in very well. I was a, uh, a dandy, but he was a Greek boy, so he did fit in too, or I guess you'd say a Roman boy with mm -hmm. Fellini. And why do you mention the glamour? Because before Stonewall, gay, the gay spaces would have been in dingy. Oh my God, if you, I hadn't even thought about this, but the contrast between a place like the Stonewall, and this is just four years before, which is that, dirty, dark, dank, smelly, uh, poverty-stricken <laughs> bar. And then here we are, four years later, in the Rainbow Room, the most glamorous setting with New York lights laid out before you, with everybody in beautiful costumes, they're looking their finest, living the life of, uh, of kings and queens. And, um, I mean, what a contrast to what it had been four years before. So I guess you could say, in some respects, things changed pretty, pretty rapidly. Do you guys have questions uh, that you want to ask? No, I didn't have anything. Listen You're in all. Yeah, I'm in all the stories. Yes, I am gay, if you wondered. That's probably a question you had. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to add in closing? Oh, I'm to think. I was, there were things I was thinking I wanted to say, and I've probably forgotten them and will think of them later, but... Um, well, I mean, the bar scene did continue to expand. And the, uh, the GAA opened up these spaces. There was this, in a firehouse, the firehouse in Soho mm -hmm. was the place. And I think I went there a couple of times, but it did have a distinctly hippie orientation. And I was not hippie oriented at that point, at least in my appearance. Mm -hmm. I considered myself more of the, the fashion chic. I might add that in 1970, the truly cool and groovy gays were, had already shaved their, their hair off and had crew cuts. Mm -hmm. Gotten because of this, the 60s are over. We're now on to something new. So we had like crew cuts and Hawaiian shirts, authentic Hawaiian shirts, and either straight leg jeans rolled up or 1950s baggy pleated pants worn very high rise. This was the fashion look. So we were far removed from those hippies. The yeah, other, I know you identified with them earlier. I right? did, yeah. yeah, I did, because they were happening. Um, the other bar I should mention that came along in by 71 that was very significant 
was a place called the Sanctuary that was also, I mean, this was just not a one night affair. This was every night. And it was in a church on West 43rd Street, which is now a theater, mm -hmm. I think. And this place, people really dressed up. I mean, Andy Warhol and his superstars went there. People wore uh, hot pants. Um, it was whatever was the latest fashion trend people were wearing. And they were playing the coolest music like uh, It's Your Thing, Do What You Want to Do, and vast dance floor. Um, the whole church, needless to say. And this was, this was glamour, too. This was very glamorous. And uh, uh, 1970, also, right after all this happened, I had my first time at uh, Fire Island, which was another, a very significant gay place, and still is to some extent, but I'll tell you it was a lot gayer and a lot different in 1970 mm -hmm. than it is now. But it was one of, it was a place where the entire world was gay. I mean, this was, it was going beyond going to a bar and having everything gay. This was the world was gay at the Pines mm -hmm. and at the Grove. Everybody was there who was gay. The stores, everybody who ran them was gay. Uh, the bars were all gay. So, and the beach was all gay. So it was a, um, it was a dream life. I guess it was even more of a dream in the 50s and 60s when it was basically the same way and things were even more conservative in the outside world. But it was still a contrast to daily life in New York City to, to go out to the Pines for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, so maybe my, my last question is really um, about the Stonewall story because it's, you know, over the years has become the stuff of myth, really, the story today. Well, it seems fairly recent, but it, 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 I think it may have been going, this may be going on for 20 years. History seems to be tainted or turned to reflect whatever is the current sensibility or idea. And now, trans people are very fashionable. Everything has to be trans. Everybody has to be trans. And uh, everybody wants to claim a part of what happened at the Stonewall, as though it's an equal opportunity riot. This was not. It was for the people. It was the people who were there. It was the people who went to the stone wall. It was the people who hang out in front of the stone wall. Uh, there were a, a few, a very few trans people. There were drag queens, more drag queens than true trans people, needless to say, but not even that many drag queens. Also, as I noted before, I mean, the, the extreme representation now that I have read is that the Stonewall riot was really all about trans people of color, and everybody else was just in the background. And as I have just explained, that's not what it was. Okay, that would be very politically correct today if that were the way it had happened, but that's not the way it happened. And I'm here to tell for all those people like John Goodman, who died of AIDS in 1991, that this is the true story of what happened. Mm -hmm. It was not, the Stonewall was not a trans people of color bar. It was a white bar with a sprinkling of drag queens. We should end it there. Yeah, yeah it was a great